Welcome back. So today we're going to talk about a uh, little bit of speciation as well as uh, the history of, er, of life on Earth. So as we've been talking about evolution, we're really talking about um, phylogeny, phylogenetic trees. These things are, are representations of how things have evolved over time, but we're really looking at macro evolution, really the, the, the major changes that have occurred for, uh, throughout species throughout time. But Somewhere along the way, there needs to be microevolution. There needs to be small changes that are going to amount to these big changes. And when we're looking at small changes, we're really looking at speciation. So a species is a group of organisms that mate with each other. That that's the typically the the term that that or the the definition for the term. Now we'll talk more about um, where this gets a little wonky, but think of it as anything that's going to mate with one another. So if you you know, obviously there's many different types of frogs, but not one type of, or one species of frog is not going to meet with another species of frog, even though that they are frogs. So we're talking about specific organisms, specific groups of organisms. That is one species. And speciation is the divergence of the lineages and emergence of reproductive isolation between the lineages. So where we start to see that, um, a species branches out into two different species and now will no longer, the, the two groups that it creates or the two species that it creates will no longer mate with the uh, with its sister species. So we've talked about species, we've talked about sister species. Now we talk about speciation, the, the divergence of these species, how one species becomes two different species that are no longer um, the same species. So most of the species concepts proposed by biologists are different ways of approaching the question of really what are species, what is a species. Um, when we look at Linnaeus, he described um, species based on their appearance, the morphological species concept, as we call it. So they look at their morphology. What do they look like? Do they look similar? Well, if they look almost identical, then they must be the same species, which we see is not necessarily the case. So members of species look alike, because they share many alleles with each other. But sharing many alleles with each other does not necessarily mean that they are going to be the same species or that they are going to uh, mate with each other. So another added layer. So he originated the binomial sy system of nomenclature where we see something like Homo sapiens, where he took the genus and the species and he used that as a way to name each individual. So instead of just calling everything, you know, a tree frog, anything that sticks to a, a tree or climbs a tree, he started to break it down into individual species where we would name them not just their common name, but we could say um, Homo sapiens or we can say uh, Hyla versicolor. These are the, the, the ways that we can really pinpoint the specific species that we are talking about. So members of the same species tend to look alike, but there are times when they don't look alike. So morphologically looking at it can get a little wonky as well. So you look at something like um, a, a uh, uh, this type of duck. Well, look, the males look similar, even if you go to different cohorts of them or different groups of them, different sex of them. You know, you go to the, the one that lives in British Columbia and you go to the one that lives in Mexico, they look very, very similar. But the same species, when we just look at the female, they look very different. So especially with birds, when you look at um, different birds, they look different based on um, the age that they are. So birds uh, birds tend to molt, where which means that they shed um, a large portion of their feathers and they get new ones in. And um, based on different ages, they have different, you could say, plumage or, or coats to them. And also, depending on what sex they are, that also changes the coat. So males are typically uh, more vibrant and, and more colorful and, and really the better looking where uh, the female ones have are more drab colors and, and not as colorful. So just right there, that kind of throws off this whole morphological concept of looking at species or identifying species. So some, some limitations when we talk about uh, the morphological concept is 
Um, members of the same species did not always look alike, and you have cryptic species where two or more species that are morphologically indistinguishable, but they do not interbreed with each other. So they're not really the same species, but you might think they are because they look almost identical to each other. So you look at these two types of tree frogs. All right, this is a gray tree frog. This is actually in our uh, a local tree frog of ours, and then you have this other type of tree frog, and and um, they look almost identical but they are two different species that will not mate with each other. So they're not the same species. So that whole morphological way of looking at species uh, is not always perfect, not always helpful. So Ernst Myers actually came up with the biological species of concept where species are group uh, groups of uh, actually or, or potentially interbreeding natural populations that are reproductively isolated from other groups or other species. And when we talk about reproductive isolation, we're talking about two groups of organisms that can no longer exchange genes. So somewhere along the way, when we have a species um, and it splits up into two different species, they uh, become so different in their genetics that they are no longer able to come back together and reproduce. That is what we call reproductive isolation. They are now isolated to only reproduce with their specific species, and they're not going to reproduce with their sister species. And then you have the lineage uh, species concept. So the, the, the lineage concept is where species as branches of the tree of life or, or as um, parts of a phylogenetic tree that we've talked about. So a lineage is an ancestor or descendant series of populations followed over time. That's the phylogenetic tree or that tree of life that we talk about. And each species has a history that starts with a speciation event, event that starts where one lineage is going to split into two and ends either at extinction or another species event. So when we look at a phylogenetic tree, you're going to see as it goes up, you're going to have these branching events and maybe this one. Uh, goes extinct, but this one keeps going, and there's another branching event, and maybe that one goes extinct, but this one keeps going, and then there's another branching event where this one goes extinct, but this one keeps going, and that is what we're talking about, where these branching events at these nodes are speciation events. So the various species concepts emphasize different aspects of species or speciation. Um, you know, reproductive isolation allows sexual species to evolve independently and is necessary for the them to remain distinct over uh, a period of time. And the lineage concept accommodates asexually reproducing um, um, species. So where we look at um, species that don't reproduce sexually, we can't really determine, oh, are they the same species or different species? Because they are not going to, asexually reproducing species are not going to reproduce with another um, organism anyway, regardless of if it's the same species or not. So the lineage concept is helpful in looking at speciation within asexually reproducing organisms, organisms that don't have sex to reproduce. So not all evolutionary changes result in new species. You have speciation uh, requires an, an interruption in the gene flow, it re requires a, a, a split in, in, the, in the lineage. So if one uh, organism just starts to become very different. They are evolving, but you're not seeing a speciation of event where it is branching off into two other um, or, or, or two distinct species. So how can one lineage ever split into two um, um, reproductively isolated species? So how can you have um, one species and it starts to split into another species and now suddenly somewhere along the way, now these two species cannot reproduce. Well, how does that exactly happen? So you have this uh, Dobzhansky uh, Muller model where a population is subdivided and then the two groups evolve independently. So something happens where you have these uh, this this population and they are then separated for by by something. And when they are separated, now they start to each evolve on their own. And then if they were ever to be put back together, they are now too different from each other for them to interbreed. So in each lineage, new alleles become fixed at different loci. And the new alleles at the two loci are incompatible with one another. So their genetics changes so much that now they are not able to interbreed. So genetic uh, incompatibilities between the two isolated populations will develop over time. So here you see you have... Um, 
you're looking at a locus right here. We call it locus one, locus two, and it is it has gene lowercase a and gene lowercase a or allele we like to call them. Allele is a is a version of a gene. So you have allele lowercase a, allele lowercase a, and then for locus two you have allele lowercase b and, and lowercase and lowercase b. So now what happens is this this uh, you have two groups. They get separated. This group starts to evolve this way where now we have this mutation and over time that eventually leads to two mutations or or uh, or a spreading of this of this gene through reproduction now everyone starts to have two uppercase a's because it is the better allele to have in that population and now you see instead of having lowercase a lowercase a lowercase b lowercase b now you're creating an organism that has uppercase a uppercase a um, and lowercase b, lowercase b. On the other hand, you have this one that now there's a mutation where you have an uppercase b, but they maintain two lowercase a's. So over time, now this uppercase b is a better uh, trait to have, a better allele to have, and it spreads quickly. And now everyone is having that. And when you and when two organisms that both have that uppercase b come together, now you're going to create an offspring that has both uppercase B, but they also have maintained the lowercase a. So where this this lineage has maintained the lowercase b's and and uh, started to get uppercase a's, they've maintained their lowercase a's and started to get uppercase b's. So now you see, hey, this these two organisms start are starting to become completely different just in this one uh, speciation event and just by looking at this this one mutation in this one and this one mutation in this one. So you see how over time they could slowly become completely different species by, by being isolated from one another. So as they diverge um, genetically, reproductive isolation is going to increase. So as their genetics change drastically, that's going to increase the chances of not being able to successfully reproduce or interbreed. So development of reproductive isolation may take excuse me, millions of years, or it may develop in, in a very few generations like we see in this Rogisa bat uh, example that is talked about sometimes. Um, so there's two different types of speciation that, likes to, that we like to talk about. And you have allopatric speciation when populations are separated by a physical or geographic barrier. And that's usually the easiest to for students to wrap their minds around something happens where these two groups of or, or this one group of organism is broken up into two groups and the two groups now can no longer have contact with each other and and now you're seeing that okay they're not dealing with each other they're maybe living in in different um types of habitats or different um environments and that environment is is putting pressure on them differently and those pressures are changing which traits are beneficial and that is really what's naturally selecting and what's molding that species so allopatric speciation says you know what these two uh these two groups of one species are getting separated and now they are evolving on the their own as they're separately dealing with different um uh environments that they live in so in barriers can be um continents drifting uh sea levels rise and fall uh, glaciers advancing and retreating or climate change all these things can separate a, a group of organisms and 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 make it so that they cannot have contact with each other they cannot reproduce each other with each other and they're going to evolve separately so the populations evolve through genetic drift and adaptation to different environments in two areas so they're de they're dealing with different pressures from different aspects of each environment that they live in and pairs of sister species or species that are each other's closest relatives may exist on opposite sides of the geographic barrier so they branch from each other they're still st sister species but they are um, becoming separate species from one another so being a sister species does not mean you're the same species yes they're still very closely related but they are not the same species anymore. So um, you have uh, in the Pleistocene, you have the glaciation that occurred that isolated fish populations in, in the Ozark and, and the Uchita um, mountains from fish populations in the Eastern Highlands, resulting in sister species pairs. So, um, you know, you have this glaciation event, event. Uh, where you're separating these these populations and when you separate the populations now they're under different uh, restrictions and, and, and different um, um, stressors from the environment and that's how you end up having all these different types of fish where 
um, you know, you find one in one, well, it looks very different in the other, and you find one in, in one, it looks very different from the other, and one in one, and different in the other, and one in one, very different in the other, and it's because of the, the difference in the, in, the, uh, in the environment. We've talked about how natural selection is nature doing the selecting. It's the pressure that the environment is putting on them, which is picking and choosing which adaptations or which traits are beneficial in that environment that's descent with modification you're descending um, from your ancestors with different traits and the and the pressures from the environment are selecting which traits are good which traits are not good are not any good um, so some members of a population may cross an existing barrier and establish an isolated population you have fish, spe uh, finch species, birds in the Galapagos Islands. They evolved from a single South American species that colonized the island. So you had these uh, these birds that came over from South America to the Galapagos Islands, and then um, as they moved to the different islands of the Galapagos Islands, because it is this big archipelago um, or archipelago, they are going to um, they go to the different islands. They start just living on those different islands, and the different stresses of the different islands start to make them to evolve and separate into different species. So the islands of this um, archipelago are far apart and and have different environmental conditions. So you have this root. This is our ancestor finch. It then branched off, and then from there. They branched off in another speciation event, speciation event, speciation event, speciation event, until these are all different species. They may look very similar, but when they come back together, they're not going to reproduce with each other because they have become too different and they prefer to mate with their own uh, specific species. They don't want to mate with a sister species. And the same goes here, all right? You have these speciation events. These nodes are representing these changes or these these uh, dis, this dissension from the original species or, or the, the, the branching off from one species into two species. The other type of speciation where allopatric speciation is talking about um, separating them because of a physical barrier, the sympatric speciation occurs when there's no physical isolation. So it may occur with disruptive selection where individuals with certain genotypes pr prefer certain habitats or, or micro habitats within their habitat uh, where where mating takes place and over time this is going to have a big um, a big impact so if the the one species now is kind of divided into two groups where you have one that likes to mate here and one that likes to mate here or you have one that likes to eat this type of food and one that likes to eat this type of food you have this this uh, this grouping occurring and that's where one species can become uh, two species, two separate species. That's where a speciation event can occur through uh, via sympatric speciation. So uh, this appears to be taking place with apple maggot flies, which are actually local as well. So one group prefers to lay eggs on the hawthorn fruits and the other lays eggs on apples. And that has created a kind of reproductive isolation where they're not going to reproduce with, with each other. That, that male hawthorn fly is not going to um, mate with a, a, the, the female hawthorn fly because they're not going to come in contact when they're trying to reproduce because one's going to be on hawthorn fruits and one's going to be on apple fruits. So um, you also have um, sympatric speciation uh, occurring through polyploidy, which is a duplication of sets of chromosomes within a species. So once you duplicate the chromosomes, it, it creates uh, more uh, uh, um, disruption or, or or makes it more difficult for uh, reproduction to occur for the gen genetics to mix. You have autopolyploidy, which is the chromosomes duplication in a single species. Allopolyploidy, where combining chromosomes of two different species. Um, a tetraploid uh, can result in two accidentally unreduced diploid gametes combined, which we don't really talk about too much, but just something to keep in mind that now you are having um, uh, organisms that are supposed to only contribute half of their genetic information. Um, so you get half from the mother, half from the father. Well, now they're both um, um, giving or one of them is giving to to uh, uh, the, the full amount instead of half. 
and you're creating this tetraploid. So tetraploid and diploid individuals are, are reproductively isolated because their hybrid offspring are going to be triploid, which makes it even more um, difficult or, or more confusing um, and complicated for, uh, for, for the genetics to mix. So, But um, also tetraploids can self-fertilize or mate with another tetra, tetraploid. So thus polyploidy can result in complete re, uh, reproductive isolation in two different generations. Um, hybridization between closely related species can disrupt normal meiosis and result in um, chromosomal doubling. Allopolyploids are often fertile. So each chromosome has a paired, uh, a partner to pair with in meiosis. And th that also adds to the complication of understanding how we're going to uh, separate species and, and when is it that, that the species has separated. So over many generations, differences accumulate in isolated lineages, reducing the probability that individuals could mate successfully when they came back in contact, if they came back in contact. So reproductive isolation is incomplete. Hybrid, if it's incomplete, it hybridization can occur and hybrids may be less fit and selection favors non-hybridizing -hybrid parents. Um, so selection results in reinforcement of isolating mechanisms. And you have different types of isolating mechanisms where you're going to have prezygotic um, isolating mechanisms, which is going to uh, prevent hybridization from a, a occurring be uh, before uh, the zygote is formed or post-zygotic isolating mechanisms, which is going to reduce the fitness of the hybrid offspring when the zygote is formed. So one stops the zygote from being formed. The other one means that that zygote that is formed is not going to be very fit. So post-zygotic me mechanisms result in selection against hybridization, which le leads to reinforcement of pre-zygotic mechanisms. So as more, um, as, as uh, post-zygotic isolation, me me isolating mechanisms are going to reduce the fitness over time. Um, you know, the hybrids are, are, are going to ultimately become um, uh, pre-zygotically pre isolated. Um, you have mechanical isolation where there's differences in sizes and shapes of the re reproductive organisms. That's one way for pre-zygotic isolation to occur. So um, it basically stopping the zygote from forming, stopping from sperm and egg from coming together. Um, if the reproductive organs do not fit together, if the size or shape isn't right, then they are not going to be able to even form a fertilized egg or form a zygote. So in plants, it may involve pollinators. So if um, one, one uh, type of plant isn't pollinated by the by um, you know a similar type of plant, then it is not going to be able to form that zygote. You have temporal isolation where species may breed um, at different times of year or different times of day. So they might be the same species, but um, you know you have closely related leopard frog species that breed at different times of the year. So although they probably initially could have bred bred or interbred. They, these two different groups are going to choose to breed at different times of the year. So the male that likes to breed at one type time of the year of, of one of the, the groups um, is never going to come in contact or never going to breed with the female of the other group because she's looking to breed at a different time. So the male is only going to breed with the females at his group because they're on the same page on what time of year to to breed and the uh, the females only gonna breed with males of her group because she's on this they're on the same page on what time of year to to breed so you have um you know examples like this where you have these different types of of or these different species of frogs and they are going to breed at different times of the year so you see that um you know this this one is not going to um to really mix with this one and you're going to see um you know maybe there's some overlap but if you look at something with a, a sympatric population these are going to um uh, not overlap really at all so this this one would never reproduce with this one it's a completely different time of year that they like to reproduce you have behavioral isolation where individuals reject or fail to recognize mating behaviors of others. So, um, you know, mating calls of male frogs or, or even coloration uh, of, of certain types of fish or um, uh, singing of birds. These are all ways that you have uh, behavior influencing the isolation of, of two uh, groups of, of one species or, or, or two different species. So whether plants a species hybridize may depend on their pollinators, flower color, shape 
um, influence which pollen is or are attracted or, or alters where pollen is deposited. So two sympatric species of uh, co uh, columbines have diverged in flower color, structure, and orientation. One is pollinated by hummingbirds. The other is pollinated by a hawk moth. So you see that over time, these are going to become very different because uh, they, they are evolving separately. You have habitat isolation where in two close uh, two uh, closely related species evolve preferences for living or mating in different habitats. Sometimes they fulfill a different, we like to call it niche. So they're going to uh, play a different role in the ecosystem and they're going to hang out in different uh, um, areas. You have gametic isolation where sperm and eggs of different species will not fuse which is important for aquatic animals that release gametes into the open waters. Um, some post-zygotic isolating mechanisms, you have genetic differences in diverging lineages, may reduce fitness of hybrid offspring. So you have low uh, hybrid zygote uh, viability, low adult viability, and you have um, infertility within the hybrids. So um, if reproductive isolation is incomplete, hybrid zones may form where population ranges overlap. And you see this with these frogs where you have this zone right here and you have this zone, but then you have this uh, zone right here where you have a mix. So to understand the long-term patterns of evolutionary change, we must think in time scales spanning millions of years. So we talked about how um, evolution has, has gone on for billions of years and, and the major change we, we, we see take hundreds of millions of years. So we have to look at really the history of Earth and, and the records in the rock and rocks and, and the fossils to really understand um, how these changes have t taken place and really how long it takes for them to take place. So age of rock, rocks relative to one another can be determined by uh, stratigraphy. And this is looking at the layers. So in sedimentary rock layers are in the strata. Um, the oldest layers are at the bottom and uh, successively higher strata are progressively younger. Um, certain fossils are always found in younger rocks. Others are found in older rocks. So that kind of proves this whole idea that uh, we go from simple to more complex and fossils and more recent strata are more similar to modern organisms or complex organisms. So, it's, so stratigraphy re reveals much about the relative ages of, of sedimentary rocks and their fossils. Um, and really tells us about um, evolution. So in order to determine the age, we like to use this radioactive dating or radio radioisotopes, which um, over time the, the, the um, isotopes are, are, become, are changing and we're able to, to pinpoint how long it's been based on how changed that, that, they, that these isotopes are. So half-life is the time during which one half of the atoms in a radioisotope sample decay, changing into another element. So as they're changing into another element, we know how long it takes for this to occur. And we can use that. We can use, we can take a sample and see how much has decayed, how much has it turned into the other element in order to understand um, how long it, that, that, how old that rock is, how long that fossil has been there. So this is based on radiometric dating. So you have something like if I have a sample and we know that it starts out 100% of one element, okay? And then over it, over time, we know after one half-life or 5.7 um, thousand years, um, or you know, 5,700 5, years, that's one half-life. Um, half of the half of that element will have changed, okay? And then another half-life, so half of that half is going to be a fourth. That's two half-lives. Okay, now it's been uh, 11,400 years. So we can use this and there's other ones. These are um, carbon 14 is one used for th knowing how old things are in the thousands range, thousands of years. But there are other ones if you want to look at like potassium 40 um, is going to is going to be uh, from 10 million to 4.5 billion years. You have uh, uranium 234 is 10,000 to 500,000 years. So we're going to use different radioisotopes to understand how old something is, depending on um, about how old it it is. It is, or or if we're looking at uh, more recent or or something that's much older. So to to date an event, the original concentration of the isotope must be known or estimated, 
and the half life of the of the isotope must be known, which which we know, you know, carbon fourteen and and nitrogen fourteen, how long it takes and and how and what the relative abundance should be. So um, sedimentary rocks cannot be dated accurately. The materials that formed these rocks existed for uh, uh, varying lengths of time before becoming sedimentary rocks. So sedimentary rock is this rock made up of other rocks, so you can't really date that. So dating rocks older than 60,000 years requires estimating um, the isotope concentration in igneous rocks um, or, or the, the rocks that are, are formed from molten material um, that are nearby or, or with the sedimentary rock. So vo volcanic ash or lava flows that have uh, intruded into the sedimentary rock are used to date the sedimentary rock. So we know that, oh, if this igneous rock is so old then and it intruded into the sedimentary rock, then that, that sedimentary rock must be older than th that igneous rock. And now we can kind of try to figure out exactly how old that is. We also have uh, paleomagnetic dating, which uh, relates ages of rocks to patterns in uh, Earth's magnetism. So Earth's magnetic poles move and occasionally reverse, and you have um, these rocks preserve a record of Earth's magnetic field at the time that they were formed. So we can use that also as a way of dating um, rocks or, or uh, the fossils that are within rocks. So the uh, geological time scale is divided into four eons, and we ha you have the Hadean, the Archaean, you have the Protozoic, and then you have the Phanerozoic. These are the, the four eons that we break it up to. And in the Hadean, you have, this is uh, before life evolved, and then early life is the Archaean. And then you have um, the pro when prokaryotic life um, started to di diversify, and the first eukaryotes came along. Um, you have the, the Proto Proterozoic, and then the Phanerozoic is when multicellular eukaryotes di diversified. Um, so the, during the Hadean, the Ar Archaean, and the Proterozoic eons are collectively called the Precambrian. And then you have the Phanerozoic is divided into eras and periods. Um, so, you, you know, everything that, that became this fin before this Phanerozoic is considered the Precambrian. And then after that, we have more specific time, uh, times that we look at. So you have this, this Precambrian here. Okay, and then after that, you have the, the uh, Phanerozoic, where it's broken up into these three different era and, and uh, more specific periods. So it, within the uh, Paleozoic, you have the, the Cambrian. So everything before that was our Precambrian. Then you have the Cambrian, Ordovician, Solarian, um, Devonian, Carboniferous, Permian. And then you go into the Mesozoic that has the Triassic, the Jurassic, the Cretaceous. And then the, the Cenozoic is going to have the tertiary and the quaternary periods within that, that. So physical change in the Earth and its atmosphere have influenced the evolution of life, just like it's going on right now with climate change, where we see that you know increases in, in the car in carbon levels are are, are increases increasing the, the temperature of the the Earth. And uh, new species have arisen and species have gone extinct throughout the history of life, and that continues on today. So positions of the continents have actually changed over time, which some of you may have known. And um, in Alfred uh, Wegener, or Wegener, in 1912, he came up with this idea of continental drift, where people didn't really believe in it. But it, uh, once the by the 1960s, um, they had evidence of plate tectonics, or the idea that you have these land masses that are able to drift or and shift and um that's where they were able to figure out that you know the earth is constantly changing just like uh organisms are constantly evolving the earth is also constantly changing with it and that is is causing um disruptions within the the earth itself so position size of the continents influences uh, oceanic circulation patterns global climates and, and sea levels dramatic physical changes resulted in mass extinctions um, Earth's climate has shifted between warm and cold con conditions throughout time. Drops in sea level were related to glaciation and often resulted in mass extinctions. You have cold periods um, where, where long period of, of uh, long uh, of mild cl climates. So we're not just talking about winter, but we're talking about very very cold periods. In the in the quaternary um, period, it's been marked by a series of Glacial advances um, interspersed within warmer interglacial uh, in intervals. So right now we're technically still in an ice age in the big scope of things. 
um, as, we, as we move forward. So this shows you over millions of years that how the sea level has changed, and this is going to influence evolution and, and how well organisms are able to uh, survive and compete and live on Earth. So weather um, versus climate, this people also often get this confused. It, weather refers to the daily events where climate refers to the long-term average conditions. So climate typically changes slowly, but some major climatic shifts were rapid, but you know, it only took about 5,000 years for that to to take place and it changes it, it um, and it resulted in changes in, in Earth's orbit around the sun, how, how Earth was compared to the sun that is going to rapidly change the climate of the Earth itself. So some other climate shifts have been even more rapidly, usually caused by sudden changes in the ocean currents. Today's rapid climate change is due to fossil fuels, burning fossil fuels, increasing CO2, carbon dioxide concentrations within the atmosphere. And we are reversing the process of or, organic burial that occurs. So you're, you're, you're burying this organic matter. The organic matter is becoming this, these fossil fuels. And now we're not letting them be. We're actually burning them off. And, and um, it takes millions of years for us to, for those fossil fuels to, um, to form and we're burning them faster than, than you can imagine. So the current rate of increase of atmospheric CO2 is unprecedented in Earth's history. And that's where um, we run into problems because it's not just uh, climate changes that are part of Earth's history that always occur. We are actually driving it and, and, and speeding up the process of the change in the climate. So a doubling of carbon dioxide concentration will increase the a, the average Earth temperature, the, the climate changes in rainfall, melting of glaciers, ice caps, and it will raise the sea levels. All things that are going to um, put pressure on us and other species um, moving forward. So large volcanic eruptions also have major impacts on life. We see this um, through, through uh, throughout the history of, of Earth. Um, ash and SO2 are injected into the atmosphere, blocking sunlight and resulting in cooling. So collision of continents during the Permian formed a single landmass and caused uh, massive, massive volcanic eruptions, leading to the greatest extinction or mass extinction in Earth's history. So the collision of large meteorites also and comets may have also influenced or caused mass extinctions along the way in Earth, Earth's history. And evidence of collision include um, impact from craters, disfigured rocks with isotope radi ratios, um, characteristic of meteorites, meaning that you know it proves that meteorite must have been there. Atmospheric oxygen concentration has also changed over time. So we talked about um, previously in the beginning, there wasn't any oxygen, so there, the, you know, organisms weren't able to to survive. But the early atmosphere probably had little or no oxygen until bacteria evolved and and, and photosynthesis came along, which which created oxygen as a byproduct, as a waste product of its um, of of its um, <clears throat> chemical processes. So that was about 2.5 billion years ago. The oxygen dissolved in water and reacted with iron to form iron oxide, which accumulated in alternating layers of red and dark rock known as banded iron formation. And these formations are evidence of the earliest photosynthesis that occurred. So oxygen also began to accumulate in the atmosphere. You have cyanobacteria, which formed uh, stromatolites, which are abundant in fossil records and are still formed today. Oxygen released by these, these cyanobacteria allowed evolution of oxidation re reactions or the chemical processes that occurred as the energy source for ATP synthesis or, or cellular energy. About 1.5 billion years ago, um, a cyanobacteria-like uh, ancestor became symbiotic within eukaryotic cells, leading to evolution of chloroplasts. So these these um, these symbiotic organisms made their way into cells, and and they became chloroplasts, which allowed for photosynthesis with within these eukaryotic cells, um, which you know led to ultimately plants. So organisms with aerobic metabolism replaced anaerobes in most of Earth's environment over time. And oxygen also allowed larger, more complex organisms like us to evolve. Large cells have lower surface area 
to volume ratios and require a higher co oxygen concentration. Further increases in oxygen in the late Precambrian enabled evolution of multicellular organisms. So over time, you see your first life comes along, a very simple si single cellular organism, and then eventually you get to the first eukaryotes, and then the first multicellular eukaryotes, and then eventually you get to the chordates, and you move towards the vertebrates. And when we're looking at this, you see that, you know, you're, you're talking about um, this is uh, over billions of years and we don't have um, first cellular animals, okay, until, you know, uh, 600,000 years ago. So, um, I'm sorry, not 600, 600 million years ago. So, you're looking at, you know, almost 4 billion years of these slow progressions of, of becoming kind of more uh, complex bacterium before they they um, uh, became really the first eukaryotes and then eventually became animal vertebrates and then became animals. And then when we look at this Phanerozoic era, all right, this is kind of in the big scope of things, more recent history. And that's when we start to see the, the organisms that really think that we really think about when we think about organisms. So when we, when we kind of focus in on, on that, you know, you get to the um, Triassic, you see that, all right, it wasn't until then, right, um, you know, 230 million years ago that we had the first mammals. So it took a very long, it took billions and billions of years to go from single celled organism up to us. And it still took um, um, hundreds of millions of years to go from the very first mammals that were like rodents to go to us who are very evolved, distinct species. Okay, so keep these things in mind as we move forward. You know, the fossil record reveals this broad pattern in life's history, but you want to also understand how microevolution or speciation events also occur. So, you know, we use these phylogenetic trees for macroevolution, and we can also use them for microevolution. The changing physical environment on Earth is going to continue to influence um, the diversity that we see um, in life today, just like it did in the past.